give everyone a few more moments to uh, sit down, but it is time to begin, so let everyone uh, make their way in. It's good to see everyone this evening, and hopefully everyone's had a good afternoon and been able to enjoy some of the nice weather that we've had the last couple of days, kind of untypical of August, so to speak, having weather like this, so we'll take it, but uh, definitely uh, good to have those days, and I think several alluded to it in their prayers today. It was good to have that rain on Friday, too. Things were getting pretty dry, and uh, Thursday evening, Thursday night, and into Friday, so uh, God does provide, and we just have to trust and keep praying, and he, he will answer those prayers. Tonight, I've kind of picked out a few songs related to heaven, and as Christians, that should be our focus. That should be our aim, and so uh, we're going to lead these songs talking about heaven, and so uh, encourage each one to uh, sing out and uh, just think about the words of these songs. Our first song is number 864, if you'd like to follow on along in the books, Where the Gates Swing Out Never. Number 864. <clears throat> Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old world story. Then when twilight falls and my Savior calls, I shall go to Him in glory. I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown. Where the gates swing outward, never. 
song, if you're following along in the books, is number 895, I'll Live in Glory. And we're going to sing verses 2 and 3. We'll sing verses 2 and 3. We'll sing this song, then I'll make an answer. <clears throat> Number 895. We'll sing verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> I want to be of service. Okay. All right, let's, let me start that again. I used to start in that first verse, but I just want to lead the second and third. <clears throat> I want to be of service along this pilgrim way and lead the lost to Jesus. this message, Daryl Kimbrell was admitted to Bas Baptist Health this afternoon for high blood pressure, so please keep Daryl Kimbrell in your prayers. And at this time, we will go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, and then uh, please stand for the prayer and remain standing for the song afterward. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another wonderful and glorious first day of the week. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the one whom you sent, your beloved Son, to this earth that we may have a hope with you in heaven one day, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message that was brought to us this morning, and we just pray for the message that will be brought to us this night. As we prepare to leave this building for this evening, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll walk with us and guide us throughout this week and throughout life. And I pray for Daryl as he has been admitted, Heavenly Father. I pray that your hands will be upon him and others, Heavenly Father, that, that need your healing hand. We just pray that you'll just walk with them and, and guide them, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who may sin against us. And this is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Song before the lesson is number 851, I'll Fly Away, if you're following along in the books. Number 851. I'd like to have it turned on the page in case the projector goes out. <coughs> Not that that would ever happen. <coughs> Some glad morning when this life is
be number 957. Number 957. This world is not my home. There seems to be no end to Brother Doug's talent. Everything we call on him to do, he does, and well. We appreciate all of you, and it's good to see you. And we're going to be talking about evangelism this evening. The congregation here has, for some time now, put emphasis on soul winning and evangelism. It's interesting to me, and has been for many years, that there seems to be a difference between a Christian and an evangelistic Christian or a soul-winning Christian. There ought not be a difference between those two. They ought to be the same thing. And I think when you see what an evangelistic Christian looks like, you will realize, well, maybe I was more of an evangelist than I thought. Maybe I was actually doing evangelism, and although I wasn't out knocking doors and uh, asking people manipulative questions to get them into the baptistry never to be seen again, and although I wasn't doing that, which is oftentimes what we think of evangelism, maybe I am actually an evangelist after all. It's interesting that we have in our mind that there's a difference between the two. Churches grow when Christians portray the image of Jesus, and that was bigger than that when I did it, but that's okay. Uh, when Christians portray the image of Jesus and tell their friends and neighbors about him, that's all evangelism is. There was a time uh, in Grant County when we started a congregation there several years ago that we began to grow and people would call and say, what are you doing? How are you growing? And um, it, uh, we would simply tell them, well, it's not all that complicated. We talk to people about Jesus. We live uh, this lifestyle as we go through life and we simply share with him, share him with others. We uh, seem to have this unspoken division between Christians and evangelism, evangelistic Christians. I don't know why uh, these can't be in the same person. And I do believe that more often than not, they are in the same person. And so what we want to talk about tonight and, uh, are what qualities are to be found in the evangelistic Christian. And I believe that the PowerPoint is in some sort of different format than I did it, so I'm just going to preach. And uh, if you can't see that up there, that's fine with me. I'd rather do it the old-fashioned way anyway. And uh, so, uh, first of all, an evangelistic Christian looks like Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, you remember reading, beginning with verse 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him, and it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and uh, with his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy." rather than sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Oftentimes, we fail to go to the very model of evangelism. When we want to be evangelistic and preachers make us feel guilty for not being such, we uh, look every place else. Uh, there, were, uh, there are evangelism workshops, there are tricks, there are gimmicks, there are all kinds of things that people use to... Um, win souls, but when Jesus was questioned by the religious leaders, who by the way weren't evangelizing or helping the needy at all, they just didn't want him to do it because they thought they were above needy people and people who needed evangelizing. Uh, they weren't doing it and he explained to them that people who are well have no uh, need for the doctor, but those who are well. And then he said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Much of our efforts over the years, family, have, has been, have been uh, toward the inside. We uh, do a good job at exhorting the brethren. We do a good job at building up the brethren. 
we oftentimes, and I say we in a general sense, we oftentimes become uncomfortable when we have to go outside these walls and live these things in the workplace and in the marketplace and in the community. And yet, that ought to be as natural as breathing for a Christian because that's who we are. That's who we are, and, and uh, we don't turn our Christianity off. The world thinks we should turn it off when we go outside here and turn it back on when we come in here. Well, certainly that's not the case, and uh, so Jesus didn't do that. He just lived these things uh, as he went about uh, his life. And another thing you notice in verses 35 and 36 is uh, he did not isolate himself. Uh, he went about, notice in uh, Matthew 9 and verse 36, or verse 35, uh, Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among them. And so he didn't isolate himself. He went where the people were. He went to the villages, small villages. He went to the cities, uh, large cities, wherever he found himself. And he taught one-on-one -on -one and in small, intimate settings. You realize that he did that. He also preached in large public settings. The uh, Sermon on the Mount was such. The uh, feeding of the 5,000, uh, uh, they were there to hear him preach. And uh, the 4,000, and, and just imagine, at Polishing the Pulpit this past week, we had 5,300 people there. And uh, I was just sitting there on uh, Sunday morning. I think there were 3,900 in worship service or something like that. And uh, I was sitting there thinking, how in the world did Jesus do that without a microphone? Because they had everything amplified all over the place down there. And uh, he figured it out. He was able to do it. And so uh, he would preach, and, but he was in public. He uh, also healed. He helped people. He saw a need, as we talked about this morning, in the man uh, born blind. He made lives better. You may say, well, preacher, I can't heal and I can't do miracles, but you can make lives better. Did Christianity make your life better? Did it make your life better? Did it change your life? Well, certainly, if that's the case, you can change other lives. And I've seen it. I've seen it personally. As we've taught someone and you see the light come on and you see them change their lives, I've, I've seen people go from lives of sin and addiction and, and all those things to becoming model members of the church and, yes, soul winners, people who would go out and, and look like Jesus in the community and live as he lived in the community. He had compassion on them. Look at verse 36 of Matthew 9. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Well, that describes everybody you know outside the church, doesn't it? Weary and scattered like sheep with no shepherd. Uh, no purpose in their lives, no goal for the uh, betterment of themselves and for eternity. Just kind of wandering along, as we talked about this morning, wandering along through life. And he had compassion on them. What do you have? What do I have when we see those people? Oh, well, just another thousand lost people or just another hundred lost or, or whatever. Uh, he had compassion on them. He wanted to help them. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There's just not enough of us, Jesus said. And so continue to pray. And uh, you know, the commission is given to Christians and uh, the commission is not given to false teachers because they won't tell the truth. The great commission is not given to uh, non-Christians because they, they don't care. They won't carry it out. And so you and I are the world's Bible. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his uh, spokesmen and messengers. And the message won't go out unless we do that. And so pr pray, plant, prepare, send out laborers into his harvest. This church does such a good job of uh, mission work and sending out people and helping people financially to do that. And, and of course, we need to do that, but not to the detriment of our own community. 
And uh, we need to be going into our old community. I know you are, and, and as I go through some of these examples of what a, an evangelist looks like, you're going to say, well, that's me. And, and so I won't feel, leave feeling quite as guilty because maybe I have been evangelizing and just didn't know what to call it. Maybe I have been sharing my faith and exemplifying my faith, living as an example. A, an evangelistic Christian looks like Cornelius. You remember reading about him in Acts chapter 10 and verse, or Acts chapters 10 and 11. Chapter 10 and verse 2 says, He was devout. He feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, prayed constantly to God. Now isn't that interesting that this is a man, a good man, an honest man, a religious man, but he wasn't saved. He had not been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. He was getting a lot of things right. And in our culture, uh, there are those who would say he was okay because he did more good than he did bad. But that's not what God said about him. Uh, God told Peter to go in Acts 11 and verse uh, 14 uh, to preach to him. And uh, when he did, Cornelius gathered his relatives and his close friends. Who of all the people in the world do you want to be saved more than anybody else? Your relatives and your close friends. And so that's who Cornelius called together. And guess what Peter was supposed to tell him? Words by which you and all your household will be saved. Now there are some who say, well, Cornelius was already saved. Family, why in the world would you tell words by which someone could be saved to somebody that was already saved? Why would you do that? Why would you go to the trouble? He's already saved. Go tell somebody else. Of course, he wasn't saved. He was a good man. He was a religious man. He was a praying man. He was a giving man. And uh, yet, he was a lost man. Now, I know you're thinking of names right now, of friends and relatives who fit that very category. Would not cheat you in a business deal for any reason. Uh, would not tell you a lie, would not do anything out of the way, and uh, just an, an upstanding, good, honest, hard-working citizen, but never been cleansed by the blood of Christ. That was Cornelius. And Peter was gone, had to go and, and teach him those words. And after he did, he said, Can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Uh, they had received the Holy Spirit, and uh, they uh, were uh, able to be shown. Peter was shown that uh, it was okay to baptize Gentiles; that they were uh, that the the church was for everybody. Acts uh, ten thirty four. Uh, he said, "I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but anybody in any nation, any from any place, who wants to come can." And so uh, you may be an evangelist that looks like Cornelius. Maybe you have gathered your friends and your relatives, uh, your close friends, to be taught the gospel. Maybe you have taught them, and, and maybe you've lived the example before them to the point of them asking questions about it and uh, have been able to teach them. Well, that's evangelistic. That's what an evangelist looks like. That's not the only thing he looks like, but that's one aspect of it. Uh, one of the most successful things that we've done here, and uh, I don't know, I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't original with me. I'm sure some, some of you had thought of it years ago, but we have friend and family days every now and then. And uh, we have added families to the church, and we have taught people who otherwise would not have been taught because you brought your non-Christian friends uh, and family to hear the gospel. And certainly... That is, uh, that's evangelistic. If that's uh, all one can do, then uh, maybe you don't feel comfortable sitting across the table uh, talking to someone and teaching them. I uh, encourage you to get comfortable with that because that's a very effective way of teaching and set up Bible studies and the like. But if you're not there yet, it doesn't mean you're useless in the church, does it? It doesn't mean you're worthless in the church you can uh, at least invite someone, bring someone. You remember who Andrew brought to Jesus? He brought his brother Peter. Uh, Andrew didn't, uh, uh, he didn't think anything good could come out of Nazareth, but after he figured it out, he went and got his brother Peter. Was that a useless uh, invitation and something that never uh, amounted to anything? Why no, Peter came and became one of the great ones, didn't he? 
And uh, one of the ones that we're going to talk about that looks like an evangelist. So an evangelist looks like Jesus. An evangelist looks like Cornelius in that he was honest, he was good. When he heard words about uh, by which to be saved, he obeyed those words. And he brought his friends and close family or close, uh, family and close friends to hear it. An evangelistic Christian looks like Paul who looked like Jesus. In, Ma- in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Paul said, Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. In Romans 9 and verse 1, he said that he would uh, allow, if it were to be possible to do so, he would have allowed himself to be accursed so that his brethren, uh, his countrymen, according to the flesh, could be saved. Now, of course, he couldn't do that. Uh, but uh, he said, I, I tell you the truth, in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. And Paul said, if I thought it would help, I would step out of the way and let my brethren have my place. Uh, let my uh, kinsmen have my place, if I thought that were possible. Uh, we talked in great detail in a lesson some time ago about Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Our heart's desire and prayer as uh, evangelistic Christians should be that uh, the lost will be found, the lost will be saved, that we will be able to teach them. Paul went about through, uh, in Acts chapter 14, and uh, other places, every place he went, he taught. In Acts 24, when he was before Felix, he uh, taught, he was, his neck was on the line, he had been arrested, and uh, he was being tried, And yet, he talked to the ruler about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Boy, what a three-point sermon that was. And uh, how evangelistic of him. He wanted to win even the soul of that wicked ruler. Uh, Paul, in Acts 14, Acts 13 as well, was sent by the church in Antioch into Gentile territory to start congregations. And as he did so, he taught them, and uh, sometimes he was physically attacked. He was stoned and left for dead one time, and and, uh, shipwrecked and beaten and all those things because he had that compassion for the lost. We would do well to learn lessons from Paul. He said in in, uh, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19 that he had become all all things to all men for the gospel's sake. Well, all we learn from that, or one of the things we learn from it, is not be so rigid that you can't change your methods, that you can't uh, adjust. Now, we're not talking about compromising the truth, and you know we're not talking about that. Uh, you can't ever do that, but you can adjust the way you say things, the atmosphere in which uh, the teaching takes place. You can go to places where you're uncomfortable. I've gone into uh, trailer parks and housing projects and knocked doors. And to be honest with you, I was looking over my shoulder. If they'd have mugged me, they might have got $13 or something. But uh, I was always looking over my shoulder, uh, thinking uh, I might get hurt any time, but never did. And have never been bitten by a dog yet. Uh, I've, I've been close a time or two but in door knock situations. But I... Be flexible. Paul said, I made myself a servant that I might win the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. Uh, To those under the law uh, or not under the law, whatever was the case, I could adjust my methods. I could adjust my teaching. I could adjust my approach to the weak I became as weak. And I became all things to all men that by all means I might win some. I would dare say that many of you in here Uh, look are evangelistic Christians who look like Tabitha. In uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 36 and following, you remember that uh, Tabitha uh, had passed away. I don't believe you look like her in that sense. I don't think you look like you're dead. Uh, Some of you don't. But uh, they... uh, She had passed away, but it was said about her that she was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. And when she became sick and died, she was sorely missed. 
I remember one time uh, a family moved away from a congregation and in just a few weeks the congregation ran out of grape juice for the Lord's Supper. They, they went to make the Lord's Supper and there was no grape juice. And they all started looking at one another saying, where did the grape juice go? And they said, we don't even know who's been buying it all these years. And it was that family that moved away. They'd been buying it out of their pocket, not saying a word and just being sure it was stocked. And uh, when they left, nobody picked it up and, until they, they saw that, that they ran out. And so, uh, would you be missed? Are you evangelistic like Tabitha in that when you left this old world, uh, the good works and the charitable deeds that she did uh, would, would be missed? She became sick and died, and the widows were standing around Peter weeping and showing them the things that she had made and uh, how important she was to them and how much uh, they, you know, there are people. There have been people who passed away in this congregation since I've been here. I'm in my fourth year, about three months of my fourth year, and there, some people leave a big hole, don't they? They leave a big footprint when they leave. And uh, it, it takes several people to uh, fill their jobs, and I'm not going to name them. I don't want to upset their relatives and, and all, but you know who they are. And uh, sometimes we'll have to uh, hurry around and find three or four people to fill a job. That uh, that person is an evangelist. You may not think of them that way. But that's evangelistic because they are showing and living Christianity. And uh, so Peter went in and rose her from the dead, uh, raised her from the dead. Uh, we don't have that ability now. And uh, I'm sure we would have done it for some folks. But uh, he gave her his hand, lifted her up, presented her to them alive, and it became known, and many believed on the Lord. Uh, but this lady was, uh, she left a big hole when she left because she was evangelistic in that. It, we're never told that she went out on a missionary journey with Paul or that she ever started a church, but she made things and gave them to people, and she uh, lived this uh, Life of good works and charitable deeds, that's one of the best things you can do is show them your Christianity as opposed to telling them only. An evangelistic Christian looks like Aquila and Priscilla. What a wonderful Christian couple about whom we read beginning in Acts 18 and verse 1 and 2. They had been expelled from Rome uh, because the Jews were all asked to leave Rome or all driven from Rome. And they wound up in Ephesus and uh, with Paul. And uh, they, uh, Paul, they let Paul stay with them and work together because they were tent makers. And uh, they traveled from Corinth to Ephesus with him. And uh, it was there in Acts 18 and verse 26, they heard an eloquent speaker from the city of Alexandria named Apollos who was speaking and teaching uh, about Jesus and about the kingdom to come, but he only knew the baptism of John the Baptist and it was no longer in effect. So he was teaching an ineffective baptism, the baptism of Christ and uh, to receive the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2 and 38. That's what was in effect. And so uh, Aquila and Priscilla called him off to the side, tactfully taught him, could you be more evangelistic than to teach an eloquent orator who is going to be able to teach thousands or hundreds at a time? Could you be more evangelistic than to teach him the way of God more uh, purely and and uh, correctly so that he is teaching the truth? Why, of course, that is an evangelistic effort. Then Aquila and Priscilla show back up in Rome, in Romans 16 and verse 3. In 1 Corinthians 16 and 19, they have the church meeting in their house. And uh, in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 19, some of the last things written by the Apostle Paul, uh, while they were on his mind, uh, these good friends who had helped him in all these uh, evangelistic works. You may say, well, yeah, but the church was their life and I have other things that I have to do. Well, uh, the church can still be your life even though you work secular work and uh, serving the Lord and sharing uh, with him, sharing him with others can be our lives. And so an evangelistic Christian is one who looks like Aquila and Priscilla. And then, uh, although the, the thing is messed up and you can't see the top of that, uh, the, an evangelistic Christian looks like Peter. Oh, Peter. As we come to the near the end of his 
uh, account of the record of him in the Bible, he's rolled, worn, weary, fighting to the very end. He is among the very earliest of the disciples, Matthew 4 and verse 19. You know what the first thing Jesus ever said to Peter? Follow me. You know the last thing Jesus ever said to Peter? In Matthew 4, 19, he told Peter and uh, Andrew and James and John, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. The very last thing he ever said to Peter in John chapter 22, verse 18, or John 21 and verses 18 and I think verse 22, follow me. Follow me. Peter, road worn, weary, among the very earliest ones, the one who had seen everything, uh, told to the one to whom Jesus appeared in John 21 and told him to get back to work after a dismal failure had caused him to stop. You know what his dismal failure was, don't you? He denied Jesus three times uh, the night that uh, he was betrayed. And uh, he was the one who thought he never would. Maybe you're the one. I've been there. I've been there and boldly said, why, nothing's ever going to get me to change. Nothing's ever going to move me from this. But you don't know what life's going to throw at you. And uh, Peter was afraid and he denied Jesus. But then Jesus appeared to him and said, while you're able, because there's going to come a time when you can't dress yourself and people are going to be carrying you from one place to another. John 21, 18, that's exactly what it says. He says, until that time comes, you get up and get busy and feed my sheep and tend my lambs and take care of my flock, preach my word. And so uh, Peter had to be, he had to, they had to restart him every now and then. And you may be like that, but uh, it would not hurt us to look like Peter in many aspects of the way of evangelism. Boldly faced uh, persecution. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, when he was before the Sanhedrin council, he said, we cannot but speak the things that we've seen and heard. When he was standing there and they were accusing him in Acts 5 and verse 29, and don't preach anymore in this name, he said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Well, that would be a good evangelistic creed, wouldn't it? Obey God rather than men. And uh, boldly face persecution. He was miraculously delivered from imprisonment. In Acts chapter 12, he was, uh, the, the king Herod killed James with the sword. And uh, Peter was next. He was arrested and they were waiting for the uh, feast to pass. And as soon as it did, they were going to bring him out and kill him. Uh, probably behead him with a sword in the same way that they did James. But uh, he was miraculously delivered. The Lord wasn't done with him yet. He had plenty to do. Then in Acts chapter 15, when Paul and uh, Barnabas came down from Antioch with questions about circumcision for Christians, some Jews had come up and said the Christians need to be circumcised as uh, the Jews were. And they said, well, let's go down to the apostles and ask them. Peter was one of the ones who uh, had input on that discussion and said, no, Gentiles don't have to be, Christians don't have to be circumcised. That's not part of the new law. And uh, he was one of the ones who uh, formed that letter that was sent back to Antioch. And you can read that letter. We still have a copy of that very letter in Acts chapter 15. But Peter, and maybe this will give you hope, Peter was still stumbling In Galatians 2 and verse 11, Paul said, I withstood him to his face because he was uh, strong and and would welcome the Gentiles in and would eat with them and and all until the Jews from Jerusalem came. And then he he kind of withdrew himself from the Gentiles. And Paul said, I had to tell him, that's hypocritical. You can't be acting like that. And uh, so then Peter continues to dust himself off and uh, never gave up. And in 2 Peter 3 and verse 17, he tells us to uh, grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and keep growing and, and never give up. So what does an evangelistic Christian look like? Well, he has muddy shoes and strong legs from going into all the world and preaching the gospel to all creation. He has calloused hands doing whatever it takes, whatever is necessary. Jesus said, no man putting his hand to the plow and turning back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. 
He has an open heart of compassion. Paul said, I would, I would allow myself to be accursed for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He has the tenacity of a bulldog to convince and rebuke and exhort. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, with all, you know the word, long-suffering, patience. Patience. This is not a sprint. This is an endurance race. And I'm happy because I don't sprint anymore. I just keep plugging. Just keep going. And that's what we need to be doing. Did you notice the word convince in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2? Sometimes you and I think our job is to scatter the seed. Just broadcast the seed. Where it hits, it hits. And where it grows, it grows. Paul said you need to stop and take the time to convince people. Do it tactfully, do it diplomatically, do it in the Christian fashion, but don't give up on people too quickly. And another thing about sowing seed, we had a pumpkin to rot on our front porch last Halloween. It happens. And uh, my sister-in-law wrote a funny thing on Facebook. She said, it was, I think it was the day after Thanksgiving, she said, everybody's putting out the Christmas decorations and I'm still cleaning up rotten pumpkins off my porch. But we had a pumpkin to rot, and we clean all, cleaned all that up. Well, this year, a big pumpkin vine came up. It lay there all winter. And in the spring, it came up in our front landscaping. It was so pretty. I took a picture of it, because, and we left it. We let it grow way up. We had to pull it up because it finally started dying. But the point is this. That seed lay there all winter before it came up. How long does a seed, the Word of God, lie in the hearts of someone before it grows. Well, I've seen it take years. I've seen it have to be fertilized by a tragedy or a crisis. I've seen it jump-started by a horrible occurrence. You see, in this old world family, we see things that we ought not ever have to see. I know a man who was standing right next to his 17-year-old son playing a game at a youth rally activity and watched his son fall dead right in front of him. We ought not have to see things like that. But I tell you what those things will do. They'll either make you or break you. They'll either drive you away from the Lord or they'll drive you closer. And if that seed is planted there, and you have been thinking about obeying the gospel, I hope it doesn't take something like that to cause you to do so. What does an evangelistic Christian look like? Well, evangelistic Christians look like every other Christian, except we have come to realize that you can be a cleansed by the blood, poor in spirit, mournful, meek, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemaking, persecuted child of God, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together and uh, caring for widows and orphans in their time of need and showing people what Jesus looks like and simultaneously have as your heart's desire and prayer to God for them to be saved. We act upon that desire, searching for opportunities to effectively share the gospel as we go through life. You've heard me allude to Acts 8 and verse 4 many times if you've heard me preach. Uh, Because Acts 8 and verse 4 teaches what is something that I have tried to practice for a long time. I call it as you go evangelism. As you go through this life. Acts 8 and verse 4, they were scattered because of the persecution uh, going on around Jerusalem. And when they were scattered, what did they do? Those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. As they were scattered, they took this word with them. And the more they uh, moved around and the uh, more remote places to which they went, the more they taught the gospel to those people. The harvest is plenty. All All the workforce we have is you. That's it. And people like you scattered around the world. But you may be more of an evangelist than you think. Do a nice deed for somebody and then work the conversation around to saying, how are you and the Lord doing? I have a relationship with him that I think would help you. I don't know anybody in here that can't do that. If you're not a child of God, you are the field to whom we are sent. 
And I'm going to, at the end, if you let me know who you are, I'm going to get everybody in here to turn and look at. No, I'm not going to. I'm just kidding. We'll share the gospel with you in a loving, tactful manner. If you're a child of God who has gone away, why did you go away? What was it out there that was better than what Jesus offered? Think about these things. Let them bounce around in your mind. And if you need our help in any way, come as we stand and sing. beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from Supper remains prepared this evening for those that may not have had the opportunity to, to partake this morning. Would you raise your hands if you would like to be served this evening? If you would, just raise your, your hand again as the servers come near. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity this evening that we've had to hear a message from your word. Father, we're also mindful of the sacrifice of Christ, and as we give this opportunity to our members to partake of that communion with him, to recall the price that was paid for our salvation. Help us to stop thinking about everything else, but to truly recognize his greatness and the significance of that sacrifice to each one of us. His going to the cross for me. Just be with those that are partaking this evening as they partake of this emblem which represents the body of Jesus, the the very precious body that took the beating and the punishment for us. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.
Was there anyone overlooked? Let's bow together again. Father, as we continue with this memorial service, we now consider the blood that was shed. The blood that we realize is so dear to us, the very life blood that was given so that our sins may be washed away. We always have mixed emotions when we consider the sacrifice of Jesus. The pride that we have that He loved us, but the sorrow we have that He had to go through that on our behalf. We just pray that you be with each of those that are partaking here this evening. Help them to focus their minds and to truly recognize how special they are in your sight. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. If you're visiting with us, we'd certainly like to thank you for coming to be with us. Come back each and every opportunity that you can. Give us a moment here this evening to meet you. Hopefully we can make a form a relationship with you to where you don't feel like a stranger maybe the next time that you come and you feel like you're among friends and family. Give us that opportunity. Jerry, thank you for the lessons which we've heard today. I would like to mention, I didn't really look at my calendar but it ties directly into his lesson when he talks about an evangelistic Christian. We, we have a meeting that Stephen Rogers is going to be preaching. I believe it starts four weeks from today. I believe that's when it is. It's the last week of September. And, and this one is specifically aimed for us to invite friends, family, co-workers, people that need to hear the gospel. And I know sometimes it's a little nebulous when we say, you know, go out and invite people. And, and from my background, sometimes we're, you're much more goal-oriented. You're given a number. You know, here's the number to hit. I don't know what the number is to hit. But if it helps make it a little more tangible for you, if you say, look, there's four weeks, reach out to four people. Four people. It may be a brother. It may be your next-door neighbor, a co-worker. Just invite them. Just invite them to come and hear the gospel to be taught. The Word of God has the power to save them if we can just get them to hear it. So think about that individually. What can I do as an evangelistic Christian? This week, look for someone. Maybe it's a, a waiter at your table. Maybe it's a co-worker. Invite them. And just do that once each week for the next... And that's not a limit. You can do more than that. But put it into work. Put it into practice. Visitation Group 3 has a card signing this evening back in the Fellowship Hall. So those members go back there for just a few minutes and, and sign those cards and, and uh, see what we can be doing to make a difference in people's lives and let them know that we care about them. Are there other announcements that need to be made? I know we've got an announcement list that is full of people that need visits, that need calls, that need to be followed up with. Plenty of places to serve. Are there other, other announcements before we're dismissed this evening? Thank you for being here. Would you stand and we will be, uh, have a closing prayer here. Keenan's going to come up and lead us. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful for Jerry and the lesson that he presented tonight. Father, may we leave this building. May we plant the seed that, Father, you have given us. May we 
live the life that you've instructed us to in a way that people can see us. May we be the light into this community. Father, thank you so much for Jesus and his blood that cleanses all of our sins. Father, that's worth everything. And may we all see that. Father, please give us the strength to encourage people for this gospel meeting that we have. Father, thank you for people like Kenny and all of our elders, Father, that that look for speakers that, that can reach our community and that are effective, Father. We just thank you for their efforts in that. Father, we're so thankful in this congregation for, for men that serve. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus. And we just pray for guidance as we go throughout this week. We pray that you'll be with us on our way home. In Christ's name I pray, amen.